everybody. Welcome to Happy Healthy You, the podcast. I'm Connie Bowman. And today's podcast is another in our Shining the Light series, where we talk about some of the things that our mainstream media maybe doesn't want to take on, but we will here at Happy Healthy You. It's all about living happier and healthier in body, mind, and spirit. And sometimes you just got to go a little deeper. And today, that's what we're doing. We're taking on the subject of don't turn me off, stick with me here, death. We're going to talk about death, but it's going to be fun, I promise. It'll be life-changing. Today's guest is Dr. Marilyn Schlitz. She's a social anthropologist, a researcher, writer, and public speaker. She's currently the founder and CEO of Worldview Enterprises and serves as the president emeritus and a senior fellow at the Institute of Noetic Sciences. Additionally, she's a senior scientist at the California Pacific Medical Center, where she focuses on health and healing, and board member of Pacifica Graduate Institute. For more than three decades, she She's been a leader in the field of consciousness studies. And we all know consciousness is cool now, right, Marilyn? (laughs) It's so cool. So her research and extensive publications focus on personal and social transformation, cultural pluralism, extended human capacities, and mind-body medicine. She recently completed a film called Death Makes Life Possible with Deepak Chopra. And it's on the topic of death and dying and how engaging that topic in a deep and meaningful way informs the way we live our lives. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Marilyn. Well, thanks for having me here. Sounds like a great place to be. Yes. Yeah. We're just two happy girls talking about death. Why? Why not? <laughs> and, well, and life. And life. So all of a sudden, as I said, consciousness is very in. But you've been exploring consciousness and how awareness can enhance our lives and really transform our culture for so many years. And I want to talk about that, uh, the Institute of Noetic Science later, because I really think that place is cool. But first, tell us about this exciting new film, Death Makes Life Possible, that you co-executive produced with Deepak Chopra. How cool is that? What was the inspiration for producing it? Well, I've had a long-term interest in consciousness, as you mentioned, and I think I taught my first course on um, death, dying, and beyond in about 1980. So I've had a a strong interest in the topic of consciousness and and whether there is something more to our consciousness than just uh, an epiphenomenon or a byproduct of our brains. I've been interested in the possibility that consciousness survives bodily death, for example, and what is the research behind that, and how would you go about bringing an evidence-based perspective to that question? Uh, Along the way, for about a decade, I was very seriously involved in a research program to explore consciousness transformation. How is it that we change our minds? How do we change our worldviews? And along the way, as I was pursuing that, uh, I was able to interview people from many different world traditions, cultures, religions, and uh, I started asking them questions about their views on death and the afterlife, because that's the big transformation, and uh, it was a very rich experience, and I started putting it together. Uh, I had an opportunity to teach with Deepak uh, shortly after his colleague, who he was teaching with, had been diagnosed with cancer, and so I had showed a short little excerpt from some of these interviews, and he got excited. He's like, Marilyn, let's make a movie. Mm. And, uh, you know, who in the world wouldn't want to make a movie with Deepak Chopra? It was a very exciting opportunity. Uh, and then I woke up the next day and I thought, there's just no way I can do that. I don't want to take on the responsibility of, you know, all the fundraising. At that time, I was the CEO at the Institute of Noetic Sciences, so I had a big job. Um, and I was mostly concerned just about the financial aspects of it because it costs a lot to create a documentary. And I went and had lunch with him that day and told him of my, you know, concerns. And he was like, oh, Marilyn, don't worry about the money. The money will come. And, <laughs> That's uh, so deep you know, isn't it? It was a lot harder than just that. But, yeah. the, you know, we had two very successful Kickstarter campaigns and a number of private foundations that stepped up and helped us along the way. And so ultimately, uh, about two years later, we uh, finished Death Makes Life Possible and have been showing it at festivals, uh, winning some awards, and really excited by how inspiring 
uh, it seems to be for people. Uh, I'm really deeply moved at people's responses and the reviews yeah. uh, have been really, really favorable. You say that so casually. I've been in several indie films, and I know how hard it is to get into these festivals, and you've been in so many. I mean, there's so many on your movie poster. What has the reception been? I know you do talkbacks at these fe film festivals. Well, it's been remarkable and supportive and positive and, you know, people are able in the course of watching the film to laugh, to cry, to reflect on their own worldviews, their own belief systems. Um, so I would say, you know, gratitude seems to be uh, the largest response. People stay. We've been packing auditoriums and uh, it's a very surprising in a certain sense for me because death is such a taboo in our culture, but it's also a moment when people are really wanting to explore the questions, and it seems to be kind of a, um, a transformation that's happening in our culture, that people, you know, the death cafes and the conversation project, the dining with death, um, our campaign is uh, redefine death. The idea being that we want to transform fear into an inspiration for living and dying well. Uh, so the, the idea is really that we can help people to have deep and meaningful conversations to reflect on their own beliefs and ultimately to transform their fear. Yeah, yeah. And let's talk about your book a little bit later because you talk about terror. What is it? Terror management or... I'm so interested right. in Your that. Yeah, yeah. But first, I, w I must be tapping into the collective consciousness because I just wrote this book about my experience, which is why I was really attracted to you and to this film. I wrote a book called Back to Happy. It's just a short little book about my experience losing my daughter. And I feel the same way that you do. I'm, I'm really right on your page. I feel like when we can make peace with death, our own death, or for me, it was the death of the person in the world that I would have given my life for in a heartbeat. I feel, I, I feel that we can really live lives that are so much more joy-filled than, than anyone would ever expect. And, and I just want to read just this little paragraph to show you how on the same page I am. Uh, this is my last chapter. It's my last lesson that I learned. And I said, I say, death is the biggie. It's probably the basis of all human fears. We don't really know what happens when we die. Our culture has created such fearful images around death. It's no wonder we are scared literally to death. Making peace with the inevitability of death is probably our most important spiritual pursuit. Finding a sense of peace around death frees us to live our lives largely and with great love. And I just did that. That was just my own intuition. And I'm like, oh gosh, if anybody ever asked me to talk about this, how am I going to speak intelligently? I, I took it from my own, you know, personal experience. But now here you are giving me the scientific basis. So <laughs> what is the scientific basis for coming to terms with death? And how does that make us live our lives in a happier, healthier way? Well, first, I want to just pause and, you know, honor what you just read to us. That's a beautiful insight. And I'm Thank you. grateful that you shared it. And I'm, you know, sorry for your loss. Uh, I think that you having the capacity to speak out and to express your own transformation around that is very important for people to hear because so many people have face the loss of a loved one, mm -hmm. and um, it's very hard for people, and I think it is also something that can open us to, as you said, a, a profound spiritual journey that allows us to stay connected instead of separated from that love and that, that um, deep bond that we have with those people. So thank you for that. And um, yeah, it's a, a very big topic, and uh, one of the areas that I've been interested in, and you know, after completing the major production of the film, I, I dug into a book that's a companion to the movie. Uh, Deepak wrote the foreword for that, and uh, we've gotten a lot of amazing reviews on that, so excited. But uh, one of the things that I was really interested in is how we can understand this terror. Where does it come from? And what can we do to transform it? What are the practices that will help us to overcome and confront our grief? 
so I uh, started to look into what's called terror management theory. Uh, it was originally developed by Ernest Becker, who's an anthropologist, and uh, he wrote a book called The Denial of Death, and uh, for that he won a Pulitzer. Uh, and I think that really helped to catalyze a kind of conversation that hadn't been happening. But he argues that it is the big, woolly, thorny, scary thing that characterizes you know, most people, not just in the West, not just in America, but all over the world, uh, people have this kind of fear. And he argued that our culture creates these um, ways of denying or hiding from. Uh, and he, you know, in particular talks about these heroic initiatives that we take so that we will be immortal. Uh, and in the process, by not really dealing with our fear, we end up having these very aberrant behaviors. So, for example, he talks about how, you know, this fear of death is the source of a lot of the, the violence and tensions we're experiencing at a global level. Uh, we can see that uh, from the research that social psychologists have now done, based on the inspiration of Becker's work, uh, to look at how it is that people react when triggered around mortality. And if they can see it as a positive thing, and if their self-esteem is high, they don't have these negative consequences. But if not, what happens is people become very protective of their in-group. In other words, they become very identified with people who share the same value system as they do, and they become very defensive toward the outgroup, people whose views are, are different from their own. And when we think about the kind of religious and cultural violence that's going on in today's world, it's very much um, relevant to uh, this terror management theory and using what I call death awareness as an approach to peace building mm. is, I think, really fundamental and something that, you know, I've been very uh, moved by as I've taken this film out into the world. You know, right now people are translating it into Chinese, Japanese, German. Um, you know, we see that there's a hunger for this all over the world. So I'm excited and I am uh, grateful that I've had the opportunity to contribute in, in this way. Oh, I love that death awareness as a means to peace, because death is really the common experience that we all have across globally. Yeah, I just um, posted a blog last week that on my website that is an interview I did with Yasir Chadli. He's a um, Muslim imam, and he's, you know, really just a charming, wonderful human being. And he, in the in the little clip that I use, he talks about how important death is because it's something that we all share no matter where we're from or, you know, what kind of background we've grown up in. It's the great equalizer. Mm -hmm. And to the extent we can find our common humanity, I think we can overcome some of the stereotyping and, you know, prejudice that is leading to so much difficulty in the world. Do you have any more examples of some some of the more inspiring interviews from the film that you can talk about without giving too oh, much gosh, away. The film is filled with. I mean, we interviewed amazing people, people who represented you know different faith traditions. Um, we, for example, went with Lauren Artress, who's a canon at Grace Cathedral in San Francisco, and Lauren is one of the people who's pioneered the adoption of the labyrinth as a tool for spiritual practice uh, in America. It came from Chartres Cathedral mm -hmm. originally. Mm -hmm. She was able to, you know, create a movement, the Labyrinth Movement, through her work and uh, attention. And so having the opportunity to walk the labyrinth with her and for her to explain to me the various ways in which it's a rite of passage and in particular, in the, uh, in the book, I talk about it as a, a powerful grief tool, both for individuals who can process their own experience, but also as a shared experience. People can walk the labyrinth together and meet at the center and exchange some of the insights that have come up for them. So it becomes a, a very important tool for transformation, and in particular, 
for helping us to transform this fear and, um, you know, emotional instability that comes up for people. So that was one. We uh, had a really good time with, with Lauren. One of the interesting things that, you know, didn't make it into the film or the book uh, is the fact that the day we were filming with her, the Blue Angels were practicing for Fleet Week in uh, San Francisco Bay. And this is a demonstration of military might. And so here we were outside in the beauty of this magnificent labyrinth, and these bombers are going over our Mm -hmm. heads and circling with this loud roar. And so we had to, you know, pause between sentences in order for us to... um, you know, not be overwhelmed by the, the magnitude of the sound that we were getting from these, these jet planes. So that was a really interesting experience of the juxtaposition between this beautiful contemplative practice and then this profound military might, and also another expression of gratitude for those people who have lost their lives in the interest of you know, something greater than themselves. So it was a very complex day and a, a beautiful moment to, to have that experience with Lauren. Yeah, uh, yeah. So that, that was one. Um, you know, I was with a group of uh, Buddhist nuns in Taiwan uh, experiencing their meditation practices and also teaching with them. Uh, one of the uh, other projects that I have done along the way is what we call worldview exploration. And, um, you know, we coined the term worldview literacy because people need to learn that they have a worldview, that they see the world through that lens of perception, and that it influences everything about our experience. And at the same time, other people have different worldviews. And so we created a curriculum that would help us to um, share this kind of insight about worldview for kids. And so I was actually in Taiwan teaching a bunch of teachers how to bring worldview literacy into their classrooms. And one of the important pieces of that then is our worldview around death and seeing these different cultural perspectives about you know, what we expect to happen at the time of death and also what we think will happen after. Uh, a lot of differences. And at the same time, as you've said, it is the great equalizer. Yeah, there's even a, a college course now on thanatology. I just found found out about that. That's pretty interesting. I, I didn't realize it about um, dealing with people who are grieving and people at the point of death, and, and we can actually study that and choose to work in that field. So as our population right. ages... I, I think, yeah. you know, it's probably a demographic thing with mm-hmm. the aging boomers. And, you know, we have always been a generation that wanted to do things differently. Mm-hmm. And I think that, you know, that is now... Um, coming to the fore as we're confronted with our own mortality and, you know, the, you know, caretaking for aging parents mm-hmm. and so on. Yeah, yeah. So based on your conversations with so many different people from all these different cultures, did your, your personal ideas about what happens after death change at all? Or, or how did you experience this? Well, one of the things we also did in, a, in addition to the cultural perspectives is, um, You know, we interviewed scientists to talk about uh, what is the evidence for consciousness beyond the body? Is there evidence for consciousness beyond the body that would support these different faith traditions? And uh, we looked at a variety of different perspectives. So there's the near-death experiences, out-of-body experiences, uh, the literature on these case collections for reincarnation that the researchers at the University of Virginia are involved in is fascinating Mm. and, uh, you know, really close to being evidential that there's something about identity that appears to survive uh, beyond bodily death. So those uh, data were very inspiring to me. I was familiar with a lot of it, but, you know, when you're in the process of editing uh, video, as you know, you know, you listen over and over and over again, and so each time one absorbs a different kind of perspective. Sure, on it. yeah. Um, you know, my own experience, I, I when I was uh, about 15, I was in a very serious motorcycle accident, and at that time, my body was flown from the bike, and I vividly remember watching my body tumbling through the air, and so there was this 
awareness that was separate from the body. And I think that had a really profound impact on me over the years uh, as I have had my own personal experience of this separation of my consciousness from my embodiment. And so, you know, in that maybe a, a, a lessening of fear. But I will say that, you know, I uh, do believe that death awareness is a spiritual practice. And I think as I have immersed myself in this work and the, the wisdom of these magnificent people, uh, it has helped me to be more comfortable with the concepts. Yeah, and thus more happy, more at peace, right? I mean, I feel that way. I feel I having, so. yeah, yeah. So can you just talk a minute? I know you're not with the Institute of Noetic Scientists, Science, Institute of Noetic Science, but you you were there for many years. And I just wonder if you can talk about how Edgar Mitchell, the astronaut, uh, had his sort of aha moment and started the Institute and what it's all about, because I think it's kind of a cool story. Sure. Um, yeah, I worked with uh, IAMS for 21 years and still have a wonderful collaborative relationship with them. Uh, Edgar was one of the Apollo 14 astronauts. He was trained as an MIT engineer, had a lot of faith in Newtonian physics and the whole idea that, you know, those big rockets were going to get him up into space, onto the moon, and home safely, which if anybody has seen the movie Apollo 13 uh, knows it must have been a pretty scary experience. So he uh, was, you know, successful in his mission. He walked on the moon. He uh, had the opportunity to look out at planet Earth and the vastness of space and, you know, really to feel uh, what that worldview shift was like from a, a direct personal experience. Uh, he describes the most important part of the the trip for him being the journey home. Uh, he had the window seat, and so here he was looking out this little portal, uh, and they describe what was called the barbecue rotation, where as they're re-entering the Earth's atmosphere, the capsule is rotating. And so he was able to watch the sun, the moon, and the Earth rising and setting and rising and setting. And uh, in that moment, he had a couple of epiphanies sort of a, a two-pronged epiphany, as it were. Uh, the first was he looked down at planet Earth and all of its beauty, those images that we've now, you know, come to take for granted were very new and very, very fresh. And in it, he experienced a kind of deep sadness. Uh, he recognized that this beautiful, pristine, whole planet wasn't characterized by divisions. There were no ethnic boundaries, national boundaries, state boundaries. None of that appeared to him. And, and so what he saw in that moment was that the cause of suffering that we experience on a routine basis as inhabitants of Spaceship Earth uh, is really something that comes from within us. It's not something out there. It's something inside us, in our consciousness, in our worldviews. And so he really began to see that maybe the great frontier wasn't outer space, but really the nature of inner space. The second piece of his epiphany was one of interconnectedness. He recognized as he was looking at, you know, the sun, the moon, the earth, the universe, uh, that he was part of that and that the molecules in his body connected him to the moment of the Big Bang and connected him to his colleagues there in the Apollo capsule and, and to all of life. And in that moment, then, there was this sense that rather than seeing ourselves as disconnected or separate from the world, that we are really fundamentally interconnected and that perhaps, you know, we could do research that took the same kind of rigor and discernment that brought him to the moon and safely home toward understanding the nature of our human potentials. And so that was uh, in 1973 that he started the Institute of Noetic Sciences and, you know, at that point then uh, really helped to catalyze a conversation that wasn't widespread and, um, you know, really in a certain sense to legitimize this exploration of consciousness as a valid area to do research on. 
Mm, yeah, it's pretty radical when he, when he started it. How profound that Edgar Mitchell said the journey home is the most important trip. And maybe we'll use that as a segue. Where can we see the film Death Makes Life Possible? And I know there's different ways, private and public screening. So maybe you can talk about that a little bit. Great. Thank you for asking that. Um, yeah, we're still out into the... Um the film festival orbit, uh, community viewings. We invite people to, you know, get the film, watch it with others, share in conversation. We have a really great facilitator guide that can, um, you know, help to structure a conversation after people have uh, seen the film. So there's a website, deathmakeslifepossible.com, and all the information about the film, where it's showing, uh, how they can order it is all available on that Death Makes Life Possible website. So I encourage people to go there. Uh, we are really interested also in adapting it to educational programs. And so one of the projects I'm working on right now is taking the film uh, into retirement communities. We did one pilot with the film, and after I showed it, people didn't want to stop talking about it. They didn't want to go home. They oh, wanted that's to stay. cool. Yeah. It was pretty amazing. And so um, what happened is that a couple of colleagues who are associated with the retirement community uh, decided to turn it into a 10-week program. And so we've now adapted that and are taking it out to uh, retirement communities all over North America and Europe. And uh, that will be starting shortly. Uh, our goal there is, you know, not only to spread the word, deepen the conversation, but we're also interested in collecting some outcomes to see, you know, what changes for people as a result of this deep dive into their own worldview around death and this opportunity to reflect on the diversity of perspectives that we see in the movie. So it's, um, it's a really great you know, beginning for us as we want to share this and, you know, as I said, a campaign to redefine death and to really use death awareness to advocate for peace. And I think that by taking the film, taking the book, taking these educational programs out into our communities, into our families, into our workplaces, uh, it will help us to shift the paradigm and make this a more comfortable conversation. Yeah, and give people permission to talk about it because in this culture, we're so it's so taboo. It's such a still still so taboo, but. But you're changing all that, Marilyn. Yeah. Good work, good work. And the book by the same title, <laughs> when is the book coming out? When can we expect that? The book will be out um, late April, and we encourage people. It's available to order right now on Amazon. Uh, the more people who order it, the more likely we will get on some bestseller lists, and the more likely then that will attract some attention that helps to, again, legitimize this conversation. So Death Makes Life Possible is the name of the book, and it's also the name of the film, and people can find the book on Amazon. And also write a review. When you read it, write a review. I just learned that now that my book's on Amazon. The more reviews you have, the more uh, it gets the word out there. So so if you can, oh, write a nice little review. That would be so helpful. Yeah, Thanks yeah. for mentioning that. Yeah. I'll, I'll go on and write one for you, and oh. we can do a trade. Awesome, <laughs> awesome. So... Now that consciousness is officially cool, what do you think? Like, what is your intuition about the next exciting discovery that we can come to expect as as our culture sort of embraces consciousness and going within? Do you have any ideas on that? You know, there's a divide. And when we talk about consciousness, I think a big part of its emergence on the scene over the last 20 years is the development of imaging technologies like the functional MRI or uh, PET scans, sophisticated uh, EEGs. And in a certain sense, that makes the inner outer. And it has allowed mainstream materialist science to explore, you know, what's happening in our brains. And we know there's this big initiative that Obama has initiated that is about, you know, really trying to understand everything like we did with the genome, we're doing it with the brain now. Uh, so on one hand, this movement toward the consciousness revolution is, is really um, a reinforcement of materialist science. 
And that's both good and bad. It's great that we have these new tools. It's amazing what we're learning. Um, at the same time, I think there is uh, also an interest in these expanded potentials of our consciousness. And so is consciousness nothing more than our brain? Or are there these extended reaches of consciousness that, you know, allow us to experience that kind of interconnectedness that Edgar Mitchell talked about on his journey home? Uh, so I think that it's kind of split. There's still, you know, very strong interest when we look at something like mindfulness now or meditation. You know, these were very taboo areas for science. 30 years ago. When I started in this, you know, people were considered very renegade if they were exploring, you know, this opportunity. It was heresy in a lot of environments mm -hmm. to think that we could bring science to bear. Uh, I have been studying prayer, contemplative prayer, and uh, intention, and I, you know, took a research protocol through my uh, IRB, which you have to do for clinical trials. And they actually denied us on the first round because they said it wasn't relevant. <laughs> and here this was a Catholic hospital where you know people are praying right. all the time on every floor. And yet the mainstream was saying, you know, we can't, it's taboo, we can't do that. So I think that that is beginning to shift. And yet at the same time, when you look at what's happening in mindfulness, um, it's, it is very much about... Um, can we increase our efficiencies? You know, we've kind of brought mindfulness awareness into Western-based competitive, mm -hmm. you know, business-type conversations and sometimes have lost the thread of the spiritual essence of what these practices are about. Uh, I did a book called Consciousness and Healing, and Dean Ornish, uh, who's a pioneer in the area of mind-body medicine, sure. you know, talks about how, you know, these swamis and gurus and spiritual masters didn't develop these tools in order to function better in boardrooms. Right. You know, they really developed them as tools for enlightenment. And so to the extent we can remember the fullness of these practices as we move toward you know, a time when consciousness is cool. It's cool for a lot of reasons because it allows us to ask new questions, to yes. understand ourselves in new ways, and really to have a broader sense of what is our human potential. Yes, yes. And I think it all comes down to the divine feminine. So we need you. So stick with it, Marilyn. You're doing good work. We need we need to keep that, <laughs> that divine essence of, of love and femininity and and receptivity and all the good feminine things so that so that it's balanced right so that well, it's, balanced. it's bringing qualities in that you know if we go with the masculine feminine you know western science has been very masculine right it's about control and dominance and manipulation um not men but masculine Mas and the right. feminine is much more receptive and i think that what you're saying is true and I feel like I'm in good company with you, so thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Marilyn. I can't wait to see this film. I want to have a party and bring bring a ton of people, which is a great idea. If you want to, if you want a good idea for a party with a purpose, go on the website and check out the different ways that you can screen the film in your community. And, um, yeah, I, th I think that's a cool idea for bringing like-minded people together and having great, rich conversations. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast, Marilyn. I look forward to reading the book and watching the film and everything else you do for the, forever. Well, so. thank you. I think you're providing a, a forum for people to be able to explore ideas that are often really hard to do when you're on your own. So yeah, yeah. Thank you for your contribution. Awesome. And thanks for having me. Thank you.